Welcome. Um, I bet you thought I was going to talk about betrayal, but actually I'm talking about sex. So if you don't want to hear about sex, you can leave. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> I'm out of here. No, it's not a euphemism at all. It's quite literal. Um, it's a literal translation. <laughs> Right. I'm going to just start out. I'll go first, and then <coughs> Kane will go, and then Kate, and then Alexis. And um, I really don't want to go into the uh, bios, because you have it, and it's boring. And so I just want to say that um, I am the series editor of the WordWorks International imprint. And that last year at Alta, I saw Kane, met him, and his book is coming out. <coughs> in a couple of months, two months, in time for AWP. So that's one thing. Otherwise, um, I was a former cheerleader, and um, I went through AU's MFA, American University's MFA program, which, by the way, I believe was the first, this was in the 80s, that had a translation requirement. Kane <coughs> is a beekeeper. He makes honey. He plays the ukulele, uh, something else. Something else interesting that I'll think of. Kate lived in Moscow, and she didn't just study there. She um, is a language, oh, classics department head. And Kate is uh, language, Russian language. She lived in Moscow. She worked for a while as, uh, with CNN, and then she ran a business helping people find their roots in Russia. Is that true? Well, that you're correct. True. And Alexis has written 9,000 books and has been everywhere in the world. And I found out that he had sunstroke in Marrakesh. And that's about all. Oh, SUNY. I guess I should mention SUNY. OK, so this subject is about betrayal, but there are many different kinds of betrayal. There's uh, political betrayal. There's relationship betrayal. And there's uh, translation betrayal. And I'm talking in terms of translation, uh, literal versus literary. How many of you know the origin of traditore traduttore? It was uh, the Italians who called the French that uh, when they were translating Dante. And they said that the French's translations were neither accurate nor beautiful. Just thought you'd want to know that. But now I'm going to talk about sex. So I'm sure you know the uh, quote of the bride is beautiful, she is not faithful. If she is faithful, she is not beautiful. Um, somebody I know said a student in his class said that. I don't think so. I think it was Victor Hugo. But even when I went online, I couldn't find the original person who said that. So simply what that means, if the bride is beautiful, preserves the musicality, the tone, the emotional underlay um, of the poem, most likely she will not be faithful. Here, faithful meaning to the literary, uh, I'm sorry, to the literal. And if it's like uh, pretty close to a word for word translation, she surely won't be beautiful. In fact, may even dance with two left feet. But I'm not here to talk about the virtues of brides, because I believe that uh, translation is really a menage a trois. And you also always have to remember that, because there's the author, the translator, and the reader. And the reader, you run into difficulties with the reader in case there are differing expectations as the one of the translator, because the reader may be expecting a literary translation. We are, after all, literary translators. And the translation translator might be thinking of a, a lit, more of a literal translation, or the other way around, um, the perfectly beautiful, non-literal translation. Now, best of conditions, everything being ideal, I think the only thing you're going to end up with is a kind of approximation or an equivalence. I don't like that so much. It smells of math. Um, or the word I really like best is a recomposition. It's it, because it has that musical tone to it. And, um, and. So, and then I wanted to 
read to you some of these fabulous quotes I found. Nabokov, you say it. Nabokov. Nabokov said this, and I don't know how many of you know this, but it's so fabulous, because it touches on mimicry and the performance aspect of it. And I really do believe that people who um, grow up in a bilingual home have a real advantage here because they're already, their brain is already processing two languages. And it gives you different way of thinking. So anyway, what he said was that the perfect translator is one who possesses genius and knowledge and the gift of mimicry. To be able to act, act, as it were, the real author's part by impersonating his tricks of demeanor and speech, his ways and his mind with the utmost degree of verisimilitude. Umberto Eco, he said, well, the job of translation is really trial and error, and it's like being in a bazaar where the carpet salesman asks for 100, and you offer 10, and you negotiate back and forth, and you end up with 50. In any case, <coughs> translation is um, a negotiation. And I did want to um, talk about the unintended consequences of a literal translation. And so I'm going to talk about English as she is spoke. Does anyone know that? English as she is spoke is a 19th century uh, Portuguese book that was meant as a guide for tourists or travelers. And what they did was, what the author did, was translate word for word using a dictionary. And uh, so you had this strictly literal translation and then what the English is. And as I said, <coughs> I have copies of this after that you can have, and it's worth it for these jokes. Unintended. So I guess I have time for maybe one or two. So I would like, you're doing the Portuguese. Is that all right? Oh, okay. okay. So here, this is the Portuguese. And which one? You want to do all this one. Them? Let's start and see how we're doing time-wise. Yes. yes. Tenho vontade de vomitar. I have mine to vomit, <laughs> is I feel sick. <laughs> All right, maybe one more. Um, this is interesting. Quem cala consente. They'd be thrown in jail in America for that. <laughs> that not say a word consent, which translates as silence gives consent. And just one, because it's funny. Well, they're all funny to me. Uh. This one. <laughs> okay. Este lago parece me bem piscoso. Vamos pescar para nos divertirmos. The pond, it seems, me many multiplied fishies. <laughs> Let us amuse rather to the fishing. This lake looks full of fish. Let's have some fun fishing. <laughs> Okay, and now I want to talk a little about the Hebrew language. Every language has its peculiarities, but this one kind of, in my mind, is among the few that just is over the top in terms of peculiar. First of all, it was only a spoken language. It's only been a spoken, vibrant language of the street and the kitchen for 150 years. Now, it was uh, spoken before, but was really a language of diaspora Jews who knew Hebrew in, ter in terms of reading uh, the Old Testament. But in other words, all the words, telephone, car, all those, they you know, weren't in the Bible. And so this all had to be kind of invented uh, about 150 years ago. So to get uh, all, all the Hebrew words are based on root words, which are three-letter words. So the one I use as an example here is book, which is sefer, which is samech fe resh, S-F-R, okay? And from sefer, book, we get svarim, uh, books, sifria, library, beit sefer, school, uh, Sofer, author. This is interesting to me. It's Lisbor, 
which means to count. But it's the same root. And I'm not quite sure how that happened, except that maybe counting was maybe with an abacus or something. And so it involved, I don't know. But this is interesting. So from Lispor, S-P-R, pay and fay are sort of the same. You get Mispar number, Mispara, barbershop, and Sapar, barber. Um, today's Hebrew is a very rich, vital language, and it has a lot of slang, Arab words, and Americanized words. Yalla, everyone says yalla, which is like bye, let's go, and weekend and okay, I guess that's pretty universal. Okay, and so I guess I should have handed this out before. This is what Hebrew looks like. And it goes from right to left, and it has little dots, which are called nikud, which are vowels. So in kindergarten, first grade, the kids learn how to read with these vowels. Once they're in the fourth grade, no more vowels, and it's kind of like, I don't know how many of you got those matchbooks when you were younger who said, if you can read this, you can do speed writing. So it's just the consonants, and you fill in from context. So this is the Hebrew, please forgive. I work with a native speaker, which goes, do you not, it's called dooms, do you not, hachol shelori, meshavot legishme habracha shel maga yadech, al tit mahamehi hazman hamechale, lo yachos kam al neve hamibar shenotar lemiflat hashayerot. This is the literal. Dunes, the sand, my skin, yearn for blessed rains of your hand touch. Don't spend your time on nothing. The time consuming won't spare even the single oasis left for the rescue of the shelter of caravans. I haven't decided on the final translation. And there's some things that are in the original that just, just can't translate into English because they're clumsy. And so as I said, this is my basic judgment. If it's clumsy or if it's a poem in English, the author should sound as though they're writing in English. So the translation, which could t change tomorrow, in fact it changed a little on the plane, the sand dunes of my skin crave your touch, its promise of rain. Hurry. Time won't spare the only oasis left, the last to give refuge to this dusty caravan. I'll do it again. So I should say that the author is Moshe Dor. He was born in 1932 in Tel Aviv <coughs> when, so he's a sovereign. Everything was sand dunes. So sand dunes, I mean his house was built on a sand dunes, changed today. And the other thing is, is that uh, they learned Arabic in school and they really learned Bible, not as a religious thing, but as a literary and archaeological thing. So you don't have this in front of you, so you can't really see that in the original it has blessed reigns of your, R-A-I-N-S, of your hand touch. <coughs> So the first problem was blessed rains, which can sound, I don't know, it sounded a little sentimental to me, although the word blessing is really important. So I did change that to the promise. And you know, that occurred to me out of the blue, and I thought, what a genius you are. I have no <laughs> idea where it came from, but it's just, I was thinking, your touch, rain, how do I get that? And my first thought was to do the sand skins of my skin thirst for your touch. And I thought, oh, clever Barbara. But it, I got rid of it because it sounds too clever. I don't know how many of you agree with that. The sand dunes of my skin thirst for your touch. Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, the other thing was, and this I'm still playing with, the sole oasis left, the only oasis left, the one oasis left. Uh, it's soul on the paper, but I think I'm going to go the only oasis left. And then um, I did change the ending again. The last to give <coughs> refuge to this dusty caravan. You won't find dusty 
in the um, in the original. But I thought to convey kind of the age, the sense of age, and you know the broken down body, I put in dusty caravan. And otherwise, they're just the obsessions about crave, yearn, long desire, which I'm sure we all do. So that's my presentation. So, so what was the betrayal, Dusty? The betrayal was putting in the promise, oh. uh, which sort of works meaning-wise. And the Dusty Caravan uh, took the place of a Rescue Shelter Caravan. I mean, it was a clumsy word in English. Um, and I, of course, I went back and forth between res rescue, refuge, shelter, all those words. And, and as I said, my decisions are based on sound. I, I want to make a comment on your translation, and no one will agree with me. It's, it's terrible. About, it's about the word skin. No. I, I encounter the word skin all the time as a Portuguese translator, and I usually end up with flesh. But this may be my own peculiarity. Mm -hmm. It's because the K in the word skin really bothers me. And it, 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 it feels too prickly and it feels too superficial and flesh which rhymes almost with all these wonderful words like breath fresh <sighs> freshness uh, flesh to me is the skin deepened okay so and here's so you here's have a whole different here's, feel here's, here's my to say that the skin is the largest organ in the is. human body <laughs> and that there is an active quality to the word skin and flesh feels very passive to me it does yeah. it's more like the meat well, and that was not, <laughs> and that's not where the poem is going, yeah, right. because very sand dunes surface. are surface. Mm -hmm. I, very surface. Organ is an active thing. There's something mm. active in the world. So, so okay. Well, I said everyone would disagree with me. And I, and I, <laughs> I forgive my word <laughs> skin because that's know. where I found <laughs> crave, skin right. crave, which dismissed yearn, desire, long, and all that. It's hard to think of sand dunes as flesh. All right. Yeah, I well, but excuse me, it was uh, <laughs> the sand dunes <laughs> of my flesh. Crave your touch. When you think about water coming to uh, a, a region that is arid or semi-arid, the water, of course, doesn't just sit on the surface. It penetrates and gets down, and then roots and things grow up. So the flesh is what is right beneath the skin. That's the flesh is already juicy, but the skin can get dry. Yeah. There you go. That's what I was thinking of. That's exactly. You're, you're right. Flesh <laughs> does already sound juicy. Mm. All right, okay. next, <laughs> next, I'm going to really try to keep it on time. Did I go over? Is Kane, all right, did I? Did I? No, no, because he came late. It's excuse. So as I said, Kane is head, well, I didn't, is head of the uh, classics department at Davidson College in North Carolina, and he's my discovery, and Davidson has been very, very good to to him in terms of uh, giving him all sorts of honors, and the whole year, next year, off with no teaching, sabbatical, so go. Hello, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to share my time with you today by, um, by, I guess, offering an unfair accusation and an insincere confession. <laughs> we'll start with the unfair accusation. It, this, uh, the accusation that will be along these lines that I basically want to accuse the Western tradition of its betrayal of classics uh, and antiquity uh, on a number of grounds. And it's stemming in part uh, from, I'm coming from, obviously from this, from antiquity here, brush the dust off. Uh, and this, this is coming in part because of a myth of influence uh, that the classics has somehow influenced the Western tradition and permeates it uh, throughout. And, in fact, I think a better way to think about that is, is in terms of willful appropriation according to the needs period by period uh, throughout European history. And once one appropriates, of course, there's influence that occurs to some extent. But there's a lot of willful, careful appropriation of precisely those elements uh, that a culture for political reasons wants to, uh, wants to use uh, to its effect, be it, uh, be it uh, well, I won't give examples. There are positive ones, perhaps, and atrocious ones as well. But um, I'm more interested not in that relationship with the past, but in some of the effects uh, that have occurred to classics because of this, just as a discipline, as a, as a corpus uh, of literature as well. One uh, is that a high, highly oral culture uh, has, become, has been made into a, a highly literary one uh, by posterity and appreciated on those terms uh, by and large. 
So, for example, oral uh, Homer's epics, uh, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, uh, and, and even literature through the fifth century BC is really, a, really fundamentally oral. It begins to be written down as early as the end of the eighth century, but there are no spaces between words, no punctuation. Mm. It's not appreciated unless it's read aloud, often by a slave, perhaps among friends, uh, to one another, like playing back on those old tape recording, you know, the large reels. Uh, and it's only accessible through the magic of reading it aloud, having it come out of your mouth, enter your ear again, where it takes on new meaning. It's really something, uh, something far more static uh, uh, than anything we've received today. And yet we receive it uh, on our own terms today as literature that's been, uh, it's been translated into English, but it's also on the page with words separated. Uh, and we digest it silently. We can sit there and read ancient works without moving our lips. That was seen as miraculous when St. Augustine, I saw St. Ambrose reading with his lips, 5th century CE, right? So we're talking uh, a millennium later. Um, we tend also, as a result of this, if we're appropriating, appropriate, uh, appropriating classics to our own uses uh, from age to age, we're putting classics inherently on a pedestal to justify uh, the good things we do uh, because, we, because we can draw from the classics in this way. Uh, classics become something that's received cerebrally, uh, more with the mind. It's something for study. Uh, students and, and we alike will approach classics highly analytically, cerebrally, um, theoretically, uh, and on those terms as well. Classics, as in, I guess, in Part of it, we make classics foundational, or at least offer that claim, again, which gets back to the notion of influence. And we may found certain ideas upon classics. When we have ideas of our own, we may look back to the Oedipus, for example, to call some a complex Oedipal, uh, and a certain, to offer one example there. And this may be why we like our white statues and our white temples. Uh, when we think of, uh, some of us in this room know, some of us in this room surely don't that the ancient temples weren't white at all, but painted in bright reds and greens and blues. Uh, it would be thought of as quite gaudy by sort of modern American terms, I think. And I, and I think people, when they learn about this, there is a certain, maybe delight, to find, to see color and life existed in antiquity. But also I've sensed in people who learn about it a, a certain degree of resentment. Yeah. Uh, because it's almost as if these, these structures, this architecture and the statuary are held up as ideals. I don't know whether they're meant to be blank canvases on which we can build our own concepts uh, or not. But that seems to be uh, part of what's gone on here. And, and I, I want to suggest to you that we might think of this as an, I, this, and it, you know, I guess I should talk about translation and uh, translation ease as well. Um, coming perhaps, well, I can't say it, obviously not originally, but for generations, there's been a sort of a, a vocabulary and a syntax uh, that's, that's been developed over time and handed down that's useful for conveying the old, the aged, the noble, the hallowed. Um, and that's, that's a very dangerous thing. Uh, there are also, I heard it, uh, one panel uh, here at this conference, people talking about the lobe trots. The lobes trot less closely now uh, than they used to. But there's, there's still a very real thing. Uh, and there's a kind of a more <coughs> academic, distilled approach uh, to the classics, sort of getting it right, letter, you know, word by word. Uh, and both of those are problematic. Uh, and I want to suggest, that in essence, that, that our relationship with classics as a whole has been one of domestication. Uh, not in the, not in the, and I'm kind of playing with the foreignization, domestication concept, <coughs> to suggest using domestication in the sense, not in making native necessarily, but in utterly taming it. Uh, subjugating it uh, to our own ends throughout the Western tradition. And so when, when I'm frustrated by this as a teacher of classics and ancient literature, uh, and so we can come to my confession, to my disingenuous confession, that something that I'm interested in doing is bring, making classics more viscerally accessible uh, to people. And with one example, and this is the example that Barbara's been referring to, is, the, uh, is to try to make Sophocles, a work that was performed, we, many of us don't realize that these, these Greek tragedies that are put on were put on once uh, only before 17,000 people. Uh, they were meant to be received in performance. Uh, they did begin to have their text preserved after a while. We have very few, actually, relatively, uh, relatively few compared to how many went on. We're lucky to have those. 
Uh, but we, again, appreciate those as literature, not as the singular performance that they were meant to be in honor of a god in a theater, which is a temple uh, today to Dionysus. So a really religious mass cultic, cultic event that could have held, depending on the time period and how badly the war was going, uh, between half or, or all of the citizenry of Athens. So uh, to make, to get this across vis viscerally and even spiritually to some extent, I began looking for a parallel sort of American myth uh, that might serve this purpose. It's not easy to find American myths uh, that, in which someone could suspend their disbelief. And I hit upon the Wild West as a concept. And I resist, and I even prefer to call it a mythic Wild West. So we don't localize it too much uh, to any one particular spot. Um, and it's, uh, exploring this with students first, uh, and then, then on my own, I began to discover uh, certain useful aspects to this. One is the, the vernacular um, that one must employ uh, in, in translating something for this sort of setting, okay, or this part of the imagination. Um, the vernacular uh, is at once, I mean, it hits you in the gut on the one hand. Uh, at the other hand, vernacular can, uh, can be highly elevated uh, as well and achieve this sort of nobility. Uh, when I think of Westerns that they've seen, or even setting something like, um, let's say, McCarthy's No Country for Old Men, right? It's got, it's, it's a, there's a Western sensibility there. Uh, it, comes, it comes across in film as well, and probably part of that genre. Um, and this is parallel in some ways to the, a reality. It's got a sort of academic point, I suppose. It's the, the reality of Greek poetry, which has a parallel poetic language the Greek language, the ancient Greek language, a parallel poetic language, and a prosaic one. Uh, so the Sophocles, you can look up in your Greek lexicon, and they tell you which words. You can see which author used the particular word. And you find out, discover, ah, this is from the, the vocabulary of poetry versus the vocabulary of prose. <coughs> and you can mix them from time to time, but it's jarring. It's a jarring thing. So the vernacular, for me, it offered a, basically a poetic language to English that I could work in to confer some nobility uh, on the work and translation. There's also um, the matter of, I guess, I come, I guess, with my confession, there's some, I guess, small areas that I'll sort of run through, uh, little bits, points of betrayal uh, that I can describe um, that might be conceived of as betrayal. One is my dealing with names uh, in the translation. You know, we don't translate, it's a tradition that we don't translate the Greek names uh, in translations of the ancients. But many of those names, if not all of them, very, most of them, some seem to be obscure coming from Near Eastern languages, but most of them actually have meaning in Greek. But we don't call Achilles the grief to Troy man, <laughs> right? Which is what his name means, and there are puns throughout Greek literature on this mm. sense of his name. Uh, and that would have been how it was received. We don't <coughs> call Helen the destroyer, right? It's very rare. Uh, though Aeschylus puns on this, this meaning of her name. Um, uh, but in this case, we have Deanna, who's uh, main character. She ends up unwittingly killing her husband. Uh, and her name, in fact, unwittingly, according to Sophocles, her name, in fact, uh, means husband killer <laughs> or husband destroyer. So she goes in this translation as Deanna Kilman. Deanna capturing the sound, Kilman capturing that. There's, um, there's the island of Evia, if you're, if you're from Greece, uh, Euboea, if you anglicize it, Elboia in ancient Greek. Uh, but it means good for oxen. Uh, so bull better territory is what it becomes in sort of a Western context, and this is crossing over. Also moving from the nautical island country uh, to one that has territories in this particular sense, another small betrayal. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, there's also uh, Enus, wine man becomes uh, Enus Ventner instead of Enus, uh, for example. And then there are a couple of other things. Uh, uh, that are, have to do with objects, a translation of a bow and arrow into a gun and bullets. And I, these, these take their toll on me. I'm a traditionalist, classicist, right? So I, f I feel the burn of all these decisions. And when I'm laying this out for you, I'm pretty much laying out the, these, all the changes that I've made in the text, which is otherwise, otherwise really adhering closely uh, to the ancient Greek throughout. Um, a boat to go from one island to the next becomes a wagon that brings the, 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 the soon to be a corpse of the Son of God. Uh, into town, and the son of God uh, is the son of Zeus, actually, and it's the one that all the other deities still exist, but Zeus inevitably becomes God in this context, which, which I, I have come to love, because it creates 
it invites a reader in, this whole mythical landscape. Uh, but at moments throughout the text, the, it, it's punctuated with a kind of a jarring realization that no, we are reading an ancient text that's coming out of, anti out of antiquity. So there's mention of Apollo, Artemis, other deities who aren't translated and aren't major players in the play itself, uh, but more often a frequent reference to God, which has more an academic point as well. Can God, God is, I'm I, ha I, I hope you'll read from the, your translation. I don't have it here with me. You can do it by it's memory, I'm sure. I'm, I'm going to do so, a piece from it at the Declamacion tonight. So okay. There's a, God is, in Greek, uh, hotheos, it enters into the Christian tradition as hotheos, it means God. Uh, it's not a name or a proper name at all. Uh, and in fact, Zeus was called hotheos uh, throughout antiquity as well. And he's more often referred to as hotheos in the Trichinii uh, than Zeus, uh, for example. So there's an academic point that's it's really interesting that works, operates there as well. And so I, I just, the concluding thought is, while I think these sorts of elements traditionally might be argued as a, a domesticating act on my part, right? Of, con of, of adapting or conforming the text into, for a setting uh, in, in America uh, and catering to American sensibilities. But on the other hand, I really believe uh, that this act of domestication doesn't tame the text uh, in the way <coughs> that the Western tradition has, uh, but rather brings out a kind of wildness uh, inherent in the text itself, a foreignness uh, that's there, in fact. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, actually, I just wanted to say that the play that uh, Cain translated, it was Sophocles' Women of Trachis, which um, I think he was a little put out at first, but not now, I hope, is retitled, I retitled it, Murder at Jagged Rock. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, so, like Barbara, I am also a poet, and I generally, when I come to these gatherings, I want to say very clearly that I come with my poet hat on, although I also do have a translator hat. Um, and today I'm going to talk about translation from my specific language, which is Russian to English. I'm going to talk about translation of poetry in general into English and specifically American as opposed to British English. And I'm also going to talk about betrayal in translation of poetry in ways that I seek to avoid committing it. Um, I, before I was a poet or a translator, I was a language major, and uh, as many of you know who started uh, as, a language, as language majors, um, that notion of what a translation was and how it worked was very literal, word to word, and you wanted to stick very, very closely to whatever core meaning something had. And so consequently, from that perspective, almost everything about literary translation feels to me like some kind of betrayal, um, and it's sort of one of my own burdens has just been carrying that notion of such strong fidelity to a source text that, that has been a, a problem for me as a translator. <coughs> um, Russian as a language differs significantly from English. It's an inflected language. Um, it uses cases to indicate grammatical function. You know, in English, uh, changes in meaning, we can do that by adding words to a sentence or moving words around in a sentence. But in Russian, very often, changes of meaning come, they're, they're reflected in the words themselves. Uh, changes to the body of the word through inflections or by adding suffixes or prefixes. So it's a structurally a very different language. Um, and the fact that Russian is plastic in that way means obviously that syntax is much more flexible than English syntax. And there are obvious implications for a translator in dealing with that because there are things that sound <coughs> absolutely absurd to us in terms of phrases turned around uh, and, and foreign and not, or, 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 or not spoken, not, <coughs> a, not in a, a commonplace type of speech. Um, that are sound perfectly normal in Russian and Russian syntax. Um, the other thing about Russian poetry is even though in the last 25 years or so that there's been a strong push towards free verse, in general, um, it retains a strong formal bent even in contemporary poetry, even in the spoken word scene. Um, and it relies heavily on the music of the language for its power. Um, and so I, let me just say in op op opposition to that, American poetry, on the other hand, I personally am more of a formal poet than not, but the overwhelming trend in American poetry in the last 50, 60 years has been towards free verse, which is a strong emphasis on how the, the words look on the page and where the lines break. Um, of course, there's still some element of music to it, um, but in general, we, they, they're very strongly contrasting notions of what poetry and what music are. And we have a problem of how to train, uh, to translate a largely formal and musical poetic tradition into a largely informal one without it sounding like something you would get on a greeting card. Um, 
And I think even more troublesome for me um, than questions of syntax or formalism uh, are problems of poetic sensibility and tone. Um, because American poetry in the last 60 years has really you know, been by turns hip, angry, ironic, postmodern. Um, and Donald Hall very famously uh, talked, about, say, talked about the main action in American poetry taking place along the periphery of vision. So it's a really a poetry of the outsider. Um, and, and also, also a, a poetry, honestly, that's not mainstream. Um, I, I regret to say that as a poet, but uh, we are a marginal crew, uh, we poets. Um, and Russian poetry also has a strong outsider tradition, but it's more in the case of, uh, in the, in the sc scope of a, a shaman or witness poetry, and uh, much more integrated with the overall notion of society than, say, the American poet, the lone cowboy, um, to, to <laughs> coin a metaphor, right? Um, and of course, the even more important, I think, is, the, is an essential difference in the role of the poem in the two cultures that I alluded to earlier. One obvious example, even in the great 20th century Russian poems, Akhmatova, or poets, Akhmatova, and Mandelstam, Tsvitai, where they, they all wrote odes or cycles of poems to the motherland, to Russia as a concept, um, this sort of great patriotic outpouring, even as the country was literally being destroyed beneath them, and they themselves, their families were being persecuted. Um, but all we in America can think of, you know, we don't have any concept of the poetic ode to America or patriotic poetry anymore. And I point you to Inauguration Day every four years uh, when the poetic community puts our, we put on our, our, our um, collective hats and kind of shake our heads at the official inaugural poet <laughs> because the inauguration poem is so odd. It's, it, it's not something that works generally in the American cultural context. So these questions of cultural sensibility and tone are really the most difficult practical problem for me as a translator because you can't just slap on a bunch of footnotes uh, when you're translating a poem. Uh, so now that I have convinced you that it is absolute folly to try translating poetry from Russian into English, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I try to do it anyway. Um, and. Uh, I want to say, first of all, with all due respect to Robert Frost, uh, something is certainly lost in translation, but I don't personally think it's poetry. Um, and that asks, begs the question, what is poetry? And in the current issue of Poetry Magazine, uh, James Longenbach, um, by the way, this is the translation issue of Poetry Magazine, James Longenbach, who is a critic um, and poet himself, um, posits that, uh, there's an essay at the end of it, he posits that language is an artistic medium, that it functions like an artist's canvas. And he says that any work of art, and he's speaking specifically about poetry, but it doesn't have to be poetry, is, quote, a transaction between the mind and the world that is played out in the material reality of the medium. So again, looking at language as not an end, but a medium like a blank canvas, and this is similar to what some other poetic theor theorists have said, including Robert von Hallberg, who argues that poetry has really only two indispensable attributes. First and foremost is its universality. That is, it's accessible to everything. And the second is musicality. So of all these ideas about what a poem is, how it works, um, the only one that's really based or grounded <coughs> in language at all is this notion of music. So that, of course, is, is something that we work on as translators. Um, and this is what Mr. Longenbach has to say about translation and poetry. That's, again, coming from the perspe perspective of a practicing poet and, and critic, but not a translator himself. We can't expect one language to replicate the effects to which another is particularly amenable. But the act of translation does, when the host language is engaged as a medium, create a new poem a poem that asks us to attend to the sound of the words, just as we attended to the words <coughs> of the original. So uh, I think for, for, for the practicing poets among us, this is a, a sort of accepted notion of what we're doing as translators as an art form. Um, but that may be a perspective that is not shared by everybody who's mm -hmm. translating. Um, Edith Grossman uh, has a really good metaphor in her little book on um, translation for what translators do. And she talks about it being like akin to what happens when you go to the symphony. When you go to the symphony, you don't go to hear a mechanistic rep reproduction of the notes that Beethoven wrote down you know, hundreds of years ago. You go to hear the artistry of the interpretation of the conductor and the musicians in that space and time in that building. 
And she's arguing that translation should be perceived that way, not as some kind of mechanical reproduction, but as a, a living art form and an interpretation. Interpretation. Um, I realize there are, speaking in a group of translators, that there's a different also set of a sense of what an interpretation should be. Um, um, but in this case, we're talking about the sort of artistic interpretation. Um, so, what can you do as a translator? Um, aside from true rhyme, which I don't feel like I can use in an English um, English context, in a poetic context, I know I know Alexis it's is going to disagree. We just agreed about this. A bit. Yes, yeah. over breakfast we disagreed about this. But there are, of course, plenty of musical devices that we can use in English, just like we use them in Russian assonance, alliteration, consonants slant rhyme, and, and they use them differently than we use them, but we can still use them. Um, also, because English syntax is so inflexible, um, we can't do so much with word order, but what I tend to do is I will switch around words, phrases, clauses, uh, trying not to do too much harm to the original meaning, but the, I feel free to play with that because mm -hmm. English syntax just doesn't give me much other room to play uh, compared to Russian syntax that I'm coming from. Um, the real trouble for me as a translator is, and, and the, the real possibility of betrayal, as I talked about earlier, lies in tone and sensibility and finding equivalencies. I know you don't like that word. Uh, with English, you know, American teachers of poetry uh, like to talk about two registers in English, the Latinate register of words that are high and formal and used for official uh, types of descriptions of things, or magical speech, and then the Germanic register of words that uh, tend to do with things like uh, bodily functions and um, um, earthy matters, animal husbandry, or to use the Germanic word, shit. Um, so so we, we have those two very strange... to the, what the original uh, author has given you in terms of syntax, for example, vocabulary, word choice. Um, there are other criteria. I think I won't, I won't uh, bore you with them, but I'm happy to talk to you about them because they changed the way I translate. Um, they, uh, I, as I say, I came to translation as a language major. I was very literal, and what I was producing came out um, in ways that didn't really, they weren't really alive to me in English um, writing. Um, and they actually, look, looking at poem as a functioning, living, interpretive object, a work of art, as opposed to a one-to-one -one correspondence with the text, uh, was very freeing for me. Um, and I found, I had originally gone to uh, translation theory looking for some kind of checks and balance system to make sure, am I doing this right? Have I gone too far in one direction? Have I not? And what I found out was I hadn't gone far enough in, in doing my translation work. Um, I, I really don't want to downplay 
um, you know, how hard it is to translate. I've got a Russian poet friend who is a constant Russian Dadaist. And I am not, I have so far been completely unsuccessful in getting that into English. But I do think we get way too caught up in the words themselves. And um, it's, I, I think by doing that, it is a, speaking as a poet here, it's a really fundamental betrayal of the spirit of the work of art if we cannot trade, if we cannot translate <laughs> art. Okay. <laughs> That's why I said everything I was about to say. <laughs> I don't want to say that Christ, or at least uh, St. Paul, uh, had Christ say for us, uh, the word killeth, the spirit giveth life, which is exactly what she just said. So we really got to ask ourselves, what is it what we were betraying? I hope what we betray is merely the dictionary, and not the spirit of the poem of concept. And now about formal verse, because I did want to talk about formal verse, I have to admit that I agree with uh, Kathy uh, that slant verse, the uh, slant rhyme, is terribly useful in English. English is very, very weak in full rhymes, and it's very rich in slant rhymes. And I have an even greater admission to make. Uh, this is uh, Stephen Kessler, who I disagree with entirely on issues of rhyme, but I'm going to back down a little bit. Formally, theoretically, I always uh, insist that if you're going to translate a rhyme sonnet, you better rhyme it. That's what I insist on. Well, I handed in a bunch of rhyme sonnets to uh, Metamorphosis many years ago with an essay. And in the essay, I said, well, I believe in, in, in full rhyme. If the original had a full rhyme, yeah, the translation has to. And I was just sending it off when I reread my poems. And I discovered that by far the best translation of a sonnet that I was sending to Metamorphosis didn't have a single full rhyme. <laughs> what it had was an intricate weave of slant rhymes, internal <coughs> slant rhymes, assonances, consonances. It had everything except full rhyme, and it was so successful I had fooled myself, and I had thought that it was fully rhyme, so I had to rewrite my essay. All right. So there, there I have to admit, uh, Stephen, that I'm not, uh, I'd like to be completely right, but I'm not, so I've backed down myself. So I think the real question of betrayal is what are you going to betray, and certainly the denotative value of words is a, a much uh, more uh, <clears throat> sensible choice in poetry, because in poetry what we're really after is feeling. We're not after content. If we're after content, we'd read a newspaper article. <laughs> we're after feeling, and feeling is produced in many ways. But it isn't produced by a dictionary, word-for-word -word translation. Now, one of the ways feeling is produced is by sound. I mean, I just was at a session a couple hours ago where a woman, I don't, I don't know, uh, read a poem in Persian. I don't know a single word in Persian. And I was just, uh, just blown away by listening to her read a poem in Persian. How could I be blown away when I don't know a word of the language? So, so it has to be the music. And I said to the people in the room, I was the only person in the room who didn't know Arabic or Persian, I didn't know anything. I said, I'm the luckiest person in the room. Because yeah. I'm at the concert. I'm getting to hear the music, pure music of life. Of course, of course, in the end, you'd like to put the poem is so called about as well. But music is really important to me in poetry. And so uh, I will do some betrayals of the dictionary. Uh, the dictionary meaning of what's going on in order to create music. Now, I'll just give you a couple of examples because none of us, we're all practicing translators, but we have given you very few hands on examples of the kind of thing that comes up. And I'm going to return to something we've already discussed skin and flesh and all that, just by coincidence. This is a poem about a mirror. And the guy, it's a rhyme, a poem of rhyme couplets. And the poet is talking about how whatever happens through the mirror is cold. It is the opposite of real life. I think he's attacking. Dorian narcissism. Gray. And narcissism, Dorian Gray. And so the poem ends talking about what your relationship with what you see in the mirror is. And it ends this way. What you got in the in uh, in the mirror is un frio si acasala sencio. Humadia para silencio. Sio silencio. A cold that is married or is coupled, like animals coming together. A cold that is that couples without seal. Seal is the word for heat, as in rot. Like the, the stag in rot, or the cat in the back alley in heat. Seal. Um, a coupling uh, without um, rot, or without heat. Umarima para silencio simply means a rhyme for silence. Because uh, there is no other actually in the mirror. I mean, 
it's a cold replica, not an oven. This is how I translate it. It's quite divergent, so it is a betrayal of the word for word. An icy coupling, devoid of heat. A silent mating without meat. <laughs> which can offend somebody. But um, I, it's completely rhyme, and it is exactly the idea he's talking about. That there is no flesh, there is no humanity. It, it, you can love what you see in the mirror, but it's completely dead. So there's one example of a violation. Um, here's one that's, uh, uh, um, what's the word, syntactical. You, you raise the issue of syntax. Um, here's a poem about slavery, about the, the, my poet, uh, Salgado Marañón. I don't own him, but I travel with him. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and he's a great friend. Uh, he is, of course, uh, descended on half of, his, half of his blood from slaves. And so he was talking about the past in this poem. And the poem ends with the image of the Antilles. As all of you know, in most languages, uh, except for English, actually, in almost all languages, um, there is a gender for everything. And in Spanish, or in Portuguese, the Antilles happen to be feminine. So the poem ends this way. A mim que singiram caminhos o mar de antilhas laceradas. I want to talk about the laceradas. So, antilhas laceradas has to mean, in Portuguese, whipped or lacerated Antilles. That's a metaphor for because the blacks who came there were slaves. But by changing normal English word order, I got to uh, have my cake and eat it too, as you say. Listen to this. To me, with whom they sailed, his ancestors, to me, with whom they sailed their way to the sea of the Antilles, come lacerated. And now you see that it isn't just the Antilles metaphorically lacerated. It's the people who sailed there as prisoners. Because in English, after the comma, the lacerated can easily refer uh, to the um, dominating uh, subject of, of the clause, uh, to me with whom they sailed their way to the sea of the Antilles, lacerated. They were lacerated. So I've got, in English, the islands being lacerated and the people who went through, which is the real truth. In a way, it's even more poignant than, than the original. Just by Changing word order, because in English you'd normally say the lacerated Antilles, because we put the adjective before. Now about sound, I have, I have another example about sound. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a poem about looking at hibiscuses. It's a poem called Ecstasy. And the whole, <clears throat> I am now going to give an example of a change I should have made and I didn't. I only made it after the book came out and we were giving yeah. readings all over America. And we gave a reading at, at, at the new school, and someone came up afterwards and said, or actually I listened to my poet, and I suddenly realized as he was reading it aloud that I had completely fucked up the end. <laughs> I'll explain what happens. It's a poem about the movement of hibiscuses in the wind. That's all. The key word is dance. They dance. Ex ecstasy. Ecstasy. Dancing in discos na fotografia, dancing sem movimento, absortos in sua rubra calligrafia. Dancing in discos de sangue, dancing na iras de cidade, dancing na clima, dancing na rima, dancing no olho de fotografia, dancing no cromo de dia, dancing exóticos, dancing exactos, extasiados, no estático, dancing, dancing, dancing. Tem alguém aqui que fala português? No, okay. Dance means they surrender. As in sex or something. In Travis, you give yourself up. And I translated the last line, they surrender. That's how it is in the book. But every book I've sold, I cross it out and I correct it. <laughs> I correct it by hand. Of course, here's the poem. Hibiscuses dance in the photograph. They dance motionless, absorbed in their crimson calligraphy. Hibiscuses of blood. They dance, they dance in the eyes of the city. They dance these climbs, they dance these rhymes, they dance in the eye of the photograph, they dance live lithograph of day, they dance exotic, they dance exact, in ecstasy, statically, they dance, they dance, they give themselves to dance. Is how I now have it. 
and originally was a surrender. And the sound, the sound of a surrender ruined the whole bone. <laughs> because in Portuguese, they dance and they surrender is almost the same word. And I haven't noticed it till listening to him as we were doing our tour. And so then I have to, after the new school, I corrected every, every copy of the book. <laughs> right. yeah. so, so there, what I'm saying then is that the primacy of sound in this poem is so evident. Uh, if you don't get the dancing quality, you lose what the poem is trying to convey, the ecstasy of dance. And so uh, I made a slight change in the end, which is simply they give themselves to dance, and all the original said was they surrender. Mm -hmm. We have time for questions. This is answer 315. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, those are just a couple of examples. I'm happy to stop. Oh, well. Well, we <laughs> were all happy to stop. Uh, <laughs> I said I'm not. You know, I said I'm happy to stop. I mean, that's what makes you unusual. So. <laughs> trying to get something more equivalent or accurate with actually adding things. Because I think one of the things we always feel is that you, you always have to leave things out in order to try to get a good translation. But, um, and, and even in the last example you gave us, in a way, you're not really adding anything. You're bringing out something that, where you actually felt that you had to put additional stuff in there in the service of, and that seems to me a slightly different betrayal than knowing that you're leaving things out. I just wonder if you have examples of that. In formal poetry. Formal in, in formal poetry, like a sonnet, you're always adding things. One of the problems is that languages don't think as long. Uh, English, English being Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, whatever you want to call it, we're much more monosyllabic than the Romance languages. So that a Spanish or a Portuguese poem takes twice as long to say anything because of all the syllables. And so you get a lot of room to put in anything you like. <laughs> you have a lot of room in terms of iambic the talents. Yeah? And so I can give one example. This is the closing uh, two lines, the closing couplet of a, of a rhyme sonnet. And uh, in, in the original, it's about, it's about <coughs> seeing a, uh, um, a man who's a bum in the street, really, uh, walking amongst the alleys. And he flows around the alleys, feito un bicho orbendido. Um cão de rua, a farejar na lama flor de lua. Ok, rua, lua. An urban stray in search of any broom, sniffing in mud the flower of the moon. Now, I already, part of me sides with Stephen Kessler, this in search of any boom is my imposition on the poem. It's a bum who's looking for anything he can find, but the original. He's looking in the mud. He's a bum. He's scavenging. But the original doesn't talk about in search of any boon. It simply says this guy is floating around like an urbanized beast or creature, uh, uh, a, a street dog sniffing around in the mud at the flower of the moon. Probably, perhaps, a re perhaps if the mud has a little bit of water, it may be a, a, a reflection of the moon. So I kept the sniffing in mud, the flower of the moon, but I stuck in in search of any boom. And that may be a, a little archaic, it may be a little uh, over the top, and it was for the right. I want to say that from the Hebrew, there are so many biblical allusions that American audiences wouldn't know what it meant. And so I added in, um, there's a poem about Moses, and I don't, you may remember that Moses stuttered, so that when God said to him, you're the, you're the guy who's going to lead them out. And he says, why me? You know, I am slow of speech and thick of tongue. Why not my brother Aaron? And there's a, there's a story connected to why Moses stuttered. And that is that the Pharaoh was told when he was taken and raised in the Pharaoh's house that uh, a child, the, the child, would, eat, would betray him and uh, free the slaves away. And so the Pharaoh said, well, let, because he loved Moses. He says, well, let's test him. We'll put before him a bowl of coals, burning coals, and of um, gold. And we'll see what she reaches for. If he reaches for the gold, we get rid of him. So here it comes, and the baby, it's a baby, was very attracted to the gold, the glitter. And he reached out his hand for it. 
But an angel came and smacked his hand away so that he touched the burning coals and he put his hand in his mouth. Hmm. Hence the stutter. Now, in reality, that is not. Story. It's a great story. Mm -hmm. No, it's in the Talmud. It's kind of in the commentary, but it's very important for the sake of the poem. And people don't even really remember Moses stuttered, much less that story. And so I added in um, mouth as if filled with burning coals. I just put that in. No one's still going to know it, but at least it, it conveys something of, you know. So I do, I do that a lot with biblical. And I, this is strange. I use the King James translation <laughs> of Jacob. You know, he was halt. He was lame. The angel made him lame, and in the King James it says halting on his thigh. Very strange way of putting it. Right in the poem it goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know that I have added anything, but I have made significant changes. For example, I have taken poems that have a five-foot line in Russian and played with that. They might have a four-foot line in my translation. Um, it's kind of interesting because in general, any, any uh, time when you try to measure Russian against English, English has 30% more words, but but they tend to be of it, the uh, you know words that are not really significant to the to the process of the sense. And I often find that um, that that the, whatever meter the Russian original was in is not to convey the sense of what's in the original. I need to adjust the meter in English to some degree. I've yeah, the area in, in the Greek tragedy, the area of translation that, that compelled me to feel, feel like I need to add something was in uh, the choral lyrics, the choral, the choral odes. So outside of their own dialogue, are these really elaborate odes. In some way, they're perhaps the most important, most metaphoric aspect of the tragedy. That's where the, the playwright, um, the writer, the playwright would, would compose all the choreography, uh, compose all the music, as well as the words, and teach the dancers in the film. And actors and musicians through call and response, basically, uh, to train them. Really elaborate, really, really important. And, and it became important, I realized, really a student of mine said, as soon as I read a monologue out into the class to sort of see, see how, what they thought, she just said, she said, you'll never pull off the poor loads. And in that area, <laughs> so I, I began really closely, the, the translation begins adhering to the Greek really closely, but as the, the play progresses, I start to integrate some rhyme for a, a sort of a, a, a kind of a ballad effect there. And the, the addition that I'm thinking of comes at the, at the conclusion of one where I actually repeat the final line, which you might expect, you know, uh, to, to bring home a certain, the, the grand conclusion of, of the Greek ode. There's the repetition of a line. Yeah, it's not repeated in the Greek, but it's still, it would have that weight that a repetition gives us uh, in a modern song. You know, yeah, so, just, yeah, I found myself in that. Just to be clear about that, Greek, Greek prosody doesn't, doesn't... There's no rhyme. No rhyme, yeah. No rhyme at all. Yeah. It's just too easy. <coughs> yeah. Anybody else? Well, actually, I wanted to answer that same question. That once in a while, you add something because it's such a part of your culture. And, uh, and it couldn't have been in the original. And yet every reader in English will respond to it. So I end the poem here, which is in praise of Peyton. The guy is against computers and, you know, virtual worlds taking over. And he's saying, well, I hope paper will survive in some way. And I, how do you pronounce this? Origami. Origami. So his image of paper surviving is the origami tiger. And he has this whole rhyme couplet poem about it. And he ends the poem saying, in Portuguese, because in, in, in an instant, uh, it can arm itself, in, in paper can arm itself in a tiger, an or, origami tiger. Okay? And in English, I wanted the poem to end strongly, and I, of course I'm looking for rhymes, fire cannot scatter, nor can water splatter, to prevent it turning to a bright origami tiger in the night. And so I've got Blake backing me up. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and the original couldn't have had that, but I told him about it, and he was delighted. So, so there's something that's been imposed on the phone. Dangerously close to a paper tiger. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, this whole conversation has, has illustrated my response to this, what I think is a false dichotomy between formal and 
so-called free verse. Because free verse is just as formal as so-called formal verse. It's just formal in a different way. And the whole idea that the only kind of rhyme that exists is the rhyme that lands at the end of the line is, to me, absurd. I mean, as a poet, it's like my, all my poems, most of my poems are free verse, but they rhyme all over the place. You know, so, and, and I mean, rhyme, with, with Robert Duncan's sense of, of parallelism and, and uh, patterns of sound, uh, it's, a, it's a, I think, a, a more generous concept of rhyme that I think applies to most folks. In fact, that's perfect for much of the Bible, like Ecclesiastes, and for much of what we The parallelism is the rhyme, oh. not, not an actual one. Good question. I want to come back to the issue of proper names. It seems to me that proper names have a rather special status in every language, and that part of that status is that their etymology becomes invisible to most people who are speakers of the, uh, native speakers of the language. And I remember my great surprise when I started learning other languages to realize what the last names of my childhood friends meant. So that, uh, in a way, if you have a character in uh, an American uh, novel and he's named Schneider, uh, you don't necessarily want your translator into Russian to make it clear that that means Taylor. You see what I'm saying? So in a way, I'm sort of uh, opposing your proposition. Are you looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I, I, what do I do? I, uh, I feel like I have to defend my choice in this particular instance. I, I agree. And, and, uh, Someone translating Russian should be sensitive to the fact that, it, and uh, for for Americans, the last names uh, aren't looked to for meaning typically, uh, unless they're you know, intentionally. I guess if they're if they're used or deployed literate back, then it seems clear that they're playing on something thematically in the work, right? You need to be sensitive to that. But but the Greeks played with names and name and meanings of names all the time, assuming that people were bringing assumptions to them. The, the rhetoricians do it. It's done in, in tragedies. I, you know, Oedipus is, is well known. Um, uh, but when we receive Oedipus in translation, we hear his name again and again, but we don't realize that well, that it's Swollenfoot until we're getting towards the end of the whole play. But the Greeks are hearing Mr. Swollenfoot the entire time uh, leading up to that. And, it, and maybe there's some surprise because it could mean, his name could also mean Mr. Nofoot, uh, K-N-O-W, uh, and refer to his knowledge of the riddle of who walks on at one time. So there's that suspense that's achieved. That'd be tough to pull across the translation. So I think culturally the Greeks are just different than, than Americans. And I don't know enough other languages to know how commonly in other languages people would readily attach me to names. Uh, but it's certainly more so true of Greek than it is of English. That's what I would respond to. Yeah, I would, I would add to that too that um, uh, Thomas Mann, for example, in his novels, loves to, to create what he calls the German speaking names. Um, so there's this guy named Klöterjan, which doesn't really mean anything, but it sounds like this guy is just all about his testicles. You know, it's not, it's not an approximate, it's, it's an approximate. It, it sort of invites that reading. Right. Um, and Dickens so how do you explain this for that? Pardon? Dickens is Dickens, famous. of course, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Right. All this. Right. So the, the, the realist novel is full of that kind of stuff that you have to deal with because the, the intent you know, of the original is to cause these sorts of echoes. And so those pose really fascinating problems because it seems so heavy-handed to do in some ways. But like Kilman kind of works. But in Vintner, I'm not sure. You know, Are we thinking, oh, this is what the Greeks would have felt or not? But I think in some, you know, um, modern prose, it would be difficult to find that line between the sort of the gesture and the hammer, you know. You know, the original name of your hero, who doesn't really appear in the play, but was Herman, remember? Yeah. Herman, and I said, I just don't like it because it sounds German. What's a German doing in the West? And even though there were Germans in the West. <laughs> yeah. So. I yeah, he was Herman Leroy Kilman. Yes, that's it was one. Name. And, and it's, it's Heracles. And, so, and that was something I added. I called, it, I called him Herman. Uh, and that was too much of me entering into the play. And I, that was good advice, and I excised it. So 
that guilty pleasure that we have of finding something we think is just beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. in there. And I called it Herman because it was there's a, a point where she was she's worried about her husband's that Herman's fallen in love with another woman, a younger woman. And she says, you know, I'll be known as his husband, but her man. And there's this play oh, on that that works in the Greek. And, it's, and there's a play going on in the Greek, but it's not with her, it's his name. But I put it there, I mean, that name. It was, a, it was good to get rid of it. Now he goes by Hercules. Perk, well, Perk, per, 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 for sure. And I have Perk per, 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 in the West. <laughs> but I think in daily life, Roger is completely right. If you go to a foreign country, uh, and you are not totally, I'm, I'm not totally fluent, I'm just Portuguese. But, to me, whenever I discover all these names with funny meanings, I'm pointing them out and always making jokes. And they just look at me blank. <laughs> right. That's right. Exactly. So he's completely right in daily life. On the other hand, not only do we have Dickens, but everybody. Um, um, Henry James, John Marcher, who plods ahead, never sees a thing, never feels a thing, and the woman he destroys by refusing to actually love her, though he monopolizes her life, is May Barger. May possibility or springtime. They never blossom because of him. And so these things are done in literature. Yeah. But you're right, in daily life we don't notice that our names mean that we used to put uh, barrels together, <laughs> Cooper or or that Smith, the most common name in America yeah. is Smith. And nobody thinks of themselves as pounding uh, horseshoes. Yeah. But in some <laughs> let's put it this way, in some books that there's a clear intention with the naming of the characters. Yes. 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 Well, and, fairy tales. And, 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 and others, if you, yes. you would probably be stretching it to try to read something into them. But it's done more in literature than in life. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.